Good morning and welcome to uh, this month's bi-monthly webinar for HDI UK members. So just a reminder, these webinars, we hold them every other month um, and they're open to all of our HDI UK community. So that's our investigators, researchers, postdocs, te technical teams, students, fellows, management teams and everyone else. Um, so the main aims of these webinars are for our community uh, to hear about each other's research, um, to hear discussions and, and, dis and be involved in discussions around a, a specific topic of interest and to receive news and updates from HDR UK Central, including a heads up of upcoming events. Um, so a second aim is to help build our one institute. We're of course distributed across the country and uh, get together in person often, but it's great to be able to touch base virtually every couple of months. Um, this is interactive, so please do uh, make sure that you know where the Q&A facility is and um, do, you, do use that rather than the chat function. Um, and if you have any questions throughout each of the um, topics that we're looking at today, then just tap them in. You don't need to wait for, for questions to be invited. Um, and enjoy. So the features for today, so we're going to kick off with the presentation from Ro Rosalind Ego. Uh, Ros is an HDI UK UKRI Innovation Fellow um, at HDI UK London, at uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she'll be presenting on her work around data-enabled approaches to dealing with infectious disease outbreaks, so something very topical at the moment. Um, then second, a fireside chat with Georgie Humphreys, who's also online. So Georgie is a clinical data sharing manager at the Wellcome Trust, and we'll be talking about open research. Um, and then finally, as usual, we'll have our roundup from Ros Walker, our Chief Science Strategy Officer at HDI UK Central, on latest HDI UK Central news. So without further ado, I'll stop sh sharing these slides. And um, Ros, when you're ready, you can... Great. Yeah, your own and kick off. All right, can you see this now? Yes, can see it fine. Okay, I'll go in presentation mode. Okay, thanks very much for having me. Um, it's also extremely exciting to be um, on an agenda with another Ros, because that never happens. Um, and I'm go uh, my, my HCR work um, is on, the project is on uh, understanding the um, impact of non-flu respiratory infections on populations with uh, chronic diseases. And I work mostly in infectious disease modeling and using data scientific techniques to apply um, models, uh, tr transmission models to, to these kind of questions. So given that um, there is now a coronavirus outbreak in the uh, coronavirus epidemic, probably we should say now, um, I've been doing a lot of work on trying to understand these COVID-19 uh, outbreaks and epidemics and trying to see if there's um, uh, ways in which we can control them. And so uh, over in the Centre for Modelling at London School, um, I'm a deputy director of that centre and we've been doing a lot of work in a lot of different streams um, to try and uh, you know, learn something about COVID dynamics and also fundamentally with the aim of designing interventions to prevent outbreaks where possible and then to mitigate their effects where they're not. And you can see down at the bottom here, this is our URL where we're putting all of our um, analyses and work in progress. But I'm going to present today on one of our studies that just came out last week, Friday, on the feasibility of controlling outbreaks by using rapid isolation of cases and follow-up of their contacts. So this is a strategy that is currently being employed in a range in a number of countries around the world and will be the you know one of the first line interventions um, once uh, once cases are imported which you know they are at this point so um, the aim as I said is to assess the viability of this strategy isolation and contact tracing to control onward transmission from imported cases of COVID so what we did is we used the transmission model um, which means that the, the model inherently includes the uh, process of transmission of the infection from one person to another. And in that we used what's called the stochastic branching process model. So that means that each individual person generates secondary cases um, and the number of secondary cases that they generate is drawn from what we know about the average number of secondary cases that each infected person creates. So on average, we think that they, well, we're, we're gonna fix this, but let's say on average, we think that there's about 
two infections generated per person. But what's really important about this is that there's a huge amount of heterogeneity from one person to another. So a lot of people will infect no future cases and some people will infect five or six, giving us an average of two. And this shape of this distribution is very important for how difficult it is to control outbreaks. And we uh, represent this, this heterogeneity between people using a negative binomial distribution with a, a K parameter of 0.16, which means there's a lot of variation. And this is the, the same parameter values that are from SARS. That's where we got the number from. Although as things go on, there will become more evidence of what this heterogeneity between people really is for this infection. Regardless, we did this for SARS. And so when you, in the model, when you have a new case, then we draw event times for um, the average amount of time for the person who, to get infected. When do they show symptoms? That's called the incubation period. When somebody gets infected, how long is it on average until the, um, the, uh, their, the people they infect are infected. So this is called the serial interval. And how long is it from when somebody starts showing symptoms to when they become hospitalized? And this is the time to hospitalization distribution. So we drew these using probability distributions from um, early estimates of what these values are from China. And in each case, we did 1,000 simulations. And you can see these distributions here. You don't need to commit these to memory. They are in the paper, which is online now in Lancet Global Health. Um, and so uh, in the time to hospitalization, we're mostly going to focus on the short time period, which has an average of 3.8 days. But at the start of the epidemic in Wuhan, it was estimated that there was about nine days from onset of symptoms to presentation at a hospital. So that's something to bear in mind. And then the incubation period and, uh, is shown in green. And the other thing down in number C that we, um, that we also vary is right now in COVID, it's very unclear if people start to become infectious and start to transmit before they start showing symptoms. And so this is really important because for example, for something like SARS, we think they didn't. So as you don't become infectious before you show symptoms. And in which case, very rapid isolation of cases will have a bigger impact on the transmission. For something like flu, we think that people start to transmit infection about a day before they show symptoms, which means that symptom-based measures, so symptom-triggered isolation, is less likely to control because people have already started to transmit by the time they realize they're infected. Okay, so that's why we're so interested in this parameter. And what we've done here is test three values saying that there's the gray one is less than 1% of transmission occurs before the onset of symptoms, or in brown, 15% occurs before the onset of symptoms, or our pessimistic scenario, that is the pink one, 30% of transmission occurs before symptoms. Okay, so our baseline is going to be 15, but I'm gonna show you later the effect of the other ones. Okay, so in the model, we generate, we have our cases who generate secondary cases, and then how do we model the intervention? So we say contacts are traced if they're symptomatic and then they are isolated immediately. So this is what you would consider to be extremely effective. But this is isolation. So isolation is when you, um, when you uh, take somebody who has symptoms and you separate them from the population. This is different from quarantine where you take somebody who isn't ill and you separate them and wait to see if they get ill. So this is a model only of isolation of sick people. Okay, so contacts are traced and if they are symptomatic, they are isolated immediately. If when they're traced, they are not symptomatic, then we don't do anything with them. But if they later become sympt symptomatic, they're immediately isolated. And there's no transmission from isolated contacts. So we assume this is really good isolation. And as I said, there's no quarantine. So it looks like this. Um, the, for instance, person A, up at the top there, you can see all the dots. These represent those draws from the probability distributions of their durations. So they're infected at the red point. Then they get their symptoms after the incubation period for this person, which you can see doesn't have to be the same for each person. Then this is when they would have infected B, infected C, and this is the time that they would have been isolated in green. 
with that delay from onset to isolation. So even if the average is 3.8, it can be shorter, it can be longer. And the, um, and the diamond here uh, is when, if this is, because they were isolated at green, this is an infection event that would have happened had they not been isolated. So you can see here for person A, they would have infected one, two, three people, but the isolation stopped one. Okay, and then person B is traced with a probability of rho, which we're going to vary, and person C is not traced with one minus rho. Okay, and because person C is not traced, you can see that they are not isolated on symptoms and they go on to infect more people. And if you look in the um, paper, uh, then you can see a much bigger version of this figure with every possible combination. Okay, so in the model we define Okay, it define whether the outbreak has been controlled um, by two metrics that either there must be no new cases by three months or the outbreak must stay below 5,000 cases in total. They generally don't get very big, but th those are the, that's the definition of outbreak control used in the model. Okay, so the scenarios, we're gonna vary this reproduction number. So this is the average number of cases that each infected person generates. We're gonna vary the number of initial cases that, um, that the contact tracing has to deal with. We're going to allow the time to hospitalization to vary and the percent of transmission before symptoms. And we're also, this is one I didn't mention, this is the percent of subclinical infection. So how many people, you know, what proportion of the cases never show enough symptoms that they would try to report? So sometimes people call this asymptomatic, but we are being more careful and trying to say this is subclinical, they're never reported. Um, okay, so the baseline scenario is shown here. The number of initial cases is 20. The time to hospitalization on average is 3.8 days and the percent of transmission before symptoms is 15. And there's no subclinical infection. What you can see on the x-axis here is the percent of contacts that are traced in the model. And then on the Y is the, of our 1,000 simulated epidemics, how many of them were controlled within three months? And we're gonna use two point, reproduction number of 2.5 as our um, baseline scenario. So that's the black curve here. And that means on average, each new case tries to infect 2.5 people, but remember there's a lot of heterogeneity between people. So in this case, you can see, let's look at 80% of contacts traced. So that's potentially realistic in a good, in a really strong health system. If 80% of contacts are traced, then around 90% of simulated outbreaks that start like this are controlled within three months. If on average there's a higher number of secondary cases per infected person, that would be the R0 equals 3.5, then you can see at 80%, only 40% uh, of simulated outbreaks are controlled. Okay, so much lower and it's, um, non-linear. What you can see over here, this is R0 1.5, so on average each infected person creates 1.5 new infections that are 80% of contacts traced. We use the all of the simulations for control. What you might notice here is over at 0% contacts traced that there's some um, simulated outbreaks are controlled. That's because you're doing rapid isolation of cases, which as you saw in the previous figure means that the, the person doesn't achieve all of the infections that they would have achieved in the model. But also because we have this heterogeneity between uh, people in the number of infections they create, you get what is called stochastic die out. So this is because um, with this heterogeneity, most people don't infect anyone. So that's how you end up with this situation. So that is the, this is the basic reproduction number. Um, and over here, this is what we call the effective reproduction number. So the basic reproduction number is the number of secondary cases generated by each infection, infected person in the absence of control measures. The effective reproduction number is that average, but in the presence of control measures. So what you can see here at 0% contact traced, this black one is the 2.5 scenario, but you can see that the reproduction number is less than 2.5. And this is because the um, early isolation has prevented some infections. And then you can see following that line along, 
that the effective reproduction number is pushed below one at around 80% of contact trace. And when the effective reproduction number is below one, each infected person will infect on average less than one person, which means the epidemic will uh, subside. Okay, so let's, um, we, that's our baseline scenario. And I said that there's a lot of different things in the model that we can change to see what effect it has. And that's what you're seeing here. Um, let's start with A, and that is changing. In each case, the black line in the middle is the same black line that you saw, in, and it's in every figure, and it's what you saw before. That's our baseline. So we're only changing one thing per panel. Over here uh, in A, we're changing the number of initial cases. And the message from this is that if you have fewer initial cases at the beginning that you have to trace, then it, then it is more likely that you are going that in the model, you can achieve control within three months. Um, over in B, remember I mentioned the, sh the short or long time to isolation. What you can see here is that you have a, if you have a long time to isolation, then it is more difficult in the model to achieve control at the same level of contact tracing, like much more difficult actually. Um, and that's because people spend longer in community, the effect, um, and so there's more, they have more time to infect their, uh, their subsequent cases. If we look down here and see, you can see this is the, how much transmission occurs before symptom onset. And remember, because this is a model of isolation of um, symptomatic people, that if you have more of your transmission occurring before symptoms, so that's the dark purple line at 30%, it becomes much more difficult to achieve control using this method. And this signals that you may wish to do something else. Um, if you were doing quarantine, so this would be uh, taking the contacts and um, separating them from the population, even if they don't have symptoms, then this, that would have an effect there. And then over in um, panel D, you can see what about if the percent of people um, do not ever report their infection because they are never ill enough to try to report it. And you can see this has a, a pretty major effect on the probability of achieving control in the model. Even if 10% of infections are not detected, then the probability of achieving control for this scenario is much, much lower. Key thing to note here is that, the, um, that we assume that these subclinical infections uh, are just as infectious as, um, as clinical infections, which may not be true because you know, it depends really what subclinical means. And this is something we need key information for at the moment. Okay, the last point before I just summarize is that what we wanted to assess is not only if contact tracing and isolation can control outbreaks, but also um, what is the surveillance effort required to do it. And so what you can see here is the, um, the uh, number of peak number of cases. Let's just look at the top one, which is the short isolation delay. The peak number of new cases who need to have their contacts traced that week. So this is a measure of the surveillance effort to say for a scenario of reproduction number 2.5 at 80% contact trace, that means on average there will be, well, there will be around 40 new people every week that the surveillance effort needs to find all of the cases of. And this can vary from uh, around 20 to just above 100 in that case. And the, so that's to give an indication to, um, uh, to public health surveillance teams uh, what might be feasible or what might be needed. And then they can work out if it's feasible in their scenario. So the conclusions are that in our model, it's harder to control outbreaks if there's a higher reproduction number. This is not too surprising. Um, if there's slower reporting, if there's more transmission before symptoms, and if there's any subclinical infection. And these things affect the probability of achieving control in the model in different nonlinear ways. Um, and the number of cases that are being followed that need to be traced can uh, get very large. So the key limitations is that I said at the beginning, we have this heterogeneity in the individual level number of secondary cases, and we've set it the same as SARS based on our best information at the time. We did check what happens if you um, use a value that's more similar to flu. And um, 
basically the short answer is that's bad news all around. And that means that there's less heterogeneity from person to person. We, um, we have that trace contacts are isolated immediately on symptom onset and not before. So depending on um, what the public health strategy is, that might, be, that might be different. And we also assume that isolation is perfect and prevents all transmission, which might not be realistic depending on how isolation is done. Okay. Um, and so all of our, this is just one of the projects we've got uh, that we've been doing recently in the Center for Mathematical Modeling of Infectious Disease at London School. And you can see the other ones on our, um, on this, at our uh, preprint, well, it's kind of like our repository for projects. Um, and also, um, if you need a job in infectious disease dynamics, I run this website, idbjobs.org. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Roz. That was fantastic. Really, really interesting. Um, so for those of you online, it's over to you now. If you have any questions, please tap them into the Q&A box um, and Roz will uh, answer them. Um, so that was really, really interesting. That was it's so uh, good to hear some hardcore science behind the, you know, behind the sort of headlines. And Thank you. <laughs> uh, so it was really interesting. Thank you. It's complex, but really beautifully explained. It's really clear. Um, so while we wait for, for questions to come through, I wonder if Roz, if you might have them. Um, I've got, I've got lots, to. So, so bear with me. <laughs> um, so, so the first one, I guess, is, is more generic in terms of, um, you know, absolutely fantastic to see your GitHub and kind of, you know, online um, presence of the work that you're doing. And in general, I guess, um, you know, one of the great things about what we're seeing with this outbreak is just the, the whole open approach and the speed by which the scientific community has embraced this problem. And, you know, trying their best to provide solutions to, to the kind of the world and to address this challenge. Um, is that something that you take as a norm in the infectious disease surveillance world? Or do you think this, this time around has been particularly, you know, the open approach has worked particularly well? Any reflections from that? Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. I mean, um, over the past five years, I think there's been like a real change in the use of the preprint servers. So previously there was archive, then bio archive, and now specifically there's med archive, which mm -hmm. is where they funnel pretty much everything that's ep epidemiology. And so I think that that has been um, uh, really different in this particular outbreak, um, it, the use of that. Now it is tricky because this is uh, not the work is not peer reviewed and I think very early on in the outbreak we saw some of the double edged sword of this with some early papers that were picked up by the media and then turned out not to be um, reasonable so I think there's a bit of a balance and, and as the number of papers increases it becomes increasingly difficult for people to um, to kind of check through everything mm -hmm. and so it's, I think it's difficult for journalists to be honest but you know mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I do think there's been a change, yeah. And we'll pick up on the open science kind of culture with um, Georgie later as well. Mm. Um, so there's a, there's a question that's come in um, around, uh, so how is, is this work feeding into COBRA and DHSE? Uh, by being open, we put our results out there um, for whoever needs them. Uh, London School does provide, you know, ha has always provided policy support to um, whoever needs it. So. Okay. Great. And, and on that kind of a similar thread really is my train of thought was, um, uh, I guess, a, a question for consideration when you, you're just looking at the headlines and the media side of it, is that there, it could be argued, I don't know how true this is, that actually the, the health systems across the world's reaction to this outbreak, in one hand has been great, you know, they've been taking a very proactive, controlled approach, um, but actually some of the social and economic impacts that we're seeing from this outbreak, um, to a certain extent, possibly, you know, hindsight will be a great thing, um, outweigh, um, you know, actually what the medical impacts are going to turn out to be. Hopefully that's, you know, we, we hope that's the case, that it doesn't turn out to be medically significant. But, but your thoughts on that in terms of actually, you know, the, the response to this outbreak, is, that, is, is it what you'd expect from previous outbreaks? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, you are totally right that um, when you take policy interventions, then there's not just health impacts. Um, and that is undoubtedly true. The economic impacts of some of these things are huge. Fortunately, that is not really something that I need to look at. These are really difficult decisions that need to be made in the fullness of information. And all we can do is say, these are the, the health impacts and the health. But I agree with you. However, I, you know, it's, it's not really possible to say at this point, 
Um, and it's a very difficult question anyway to say, in retrospect, you overreacted because it's not possible to know what would have happened if you didn't. And so that is always the, um, you know, the, the worry that people have, oh, what if we say too much? Well, what if you don't? Yeah. And so, you know, Absolutely. it's a really, it's a difficult balancing act. I agree with that. So we've another question from uh, Zoom Land, which is, what are your thoughts about the efficacy of quarantine um, and with respect to inclusion in your model? Yeah, so uh, we purposely didn't include quarantine because we wanted to make this um, uh, model kind of applicable to um, what might happen in a range of contexts. And it's not clear to me that quarantine will be something that happens, for instance, for a long time in the UK. So that's why we focused on isolation only. And especially because that's, yeah, that's why we focus mostly on that. But quarantine, as I mentioned before, because it, um, because people, it should stop all transmission or most transmission, if, even if that transmission is happening before, um, before symptom onset. So in that case, where you saw the impacts of the uh, 0, 15, 30% transmission before, isolate, uh, before symptom onset, you would see less of a negative effect there. And that's what that would do. Yeah, again, it's a, it's a tricky one. Oh, we've got one more. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so another comment, uh, question. So you've come across really well on the news. Uh, and uh, have you had training on how to explain the science to the general public? Yeah, it's a really good question. Yes, I've had a number of people compliment you on your, <laughs> on your, on your broadcasting skills. Well. Uh, yes, yeah, so here at the London School, uh, I've done media training previously, but then also I just do quite a lot of public speaking. Um, this year I was also on the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures in a little short segment Great. about vaccination. So I think a lot of it is... Um, uh, practice but then also we have a press team here at London School who are extremely good at helping understand both what the media wants and I don't mean that in a negative way I mean that in a positive way what what can we provide that is that that they uh, that is needed and how can we convey our information um, uh, in the best possible way and so then yeah just practice Mm. Also, I got to meet Jon Snow, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that training and, and support has really has really paid off because this is really, you know, it's complex stuff to, to communicate you. and you did it very well. Uh, so one final question then before we move on to um, Georgie. Uh, so just final question. So are there any collaborations with um, economists that, that you know of uh, modelling the economic impact to create a joint model? Yeah, so I think that that's um, a really good idea. Yes, we do have some plans to work with economists, but um, I think that uh, right now, the uh, as I think it was Ros, Ros mentioned, it's a balance. And right now, it's so difficult to say, because we have so little information on what these health impacts are going to be. You know, we're bringing together pieces of information from all sorts of places. Things like the case fatality ratio, the severity, how long people spend in healthcare, these kind of questions. We, if you're trying to balance the, the pure economic impact and the health economic impacts, then you need more certainty of this. So I agree with you that economic impacts are important and they should be included. And if you want, you can email me. Um, but I, there, there's tremendous uncertainty. And I think that we have to, you know, prioritize un understanding those health impacts. This is my, my job, as well as having specialists in economics analyze that. Great. Ros, thank you very much for your time. Thank you really for having appreciate me. It. So Georgie, um, so Georgie works uh, in the open research team at the Wellcome Trust. Uh, so once you locate your, un your unmute button, uh, <laughs> No. Okay, I hope you can hear me now. We can hear you, yes. yes. Can we see you as well? Excellent, great. Yeah. Um, so before we delve into open research, and we should probably kick off specifically maybe on um, how the, the current situation with coronavirus and the relationship with open science and how that's helped. Uh, but first of all, please go ahead and introduce yourself, and maybe just a little bit about uh, what you do with the Wellcome Trust in, in open science. 
Sure, thanks Melissa and thanks for having me. I'm very happy to join. Um, my name is Georgie Humphreys, as you've heard, and I'm in a team called Open Research, which is a small team at Wellcome. There's only five of us, um, but we try and punch above our weight by uh, basically working with lots of other people and connecting and being uh, networkers. And, and so we, we talk a lot both within Wellcome and externally to various other stakeholders. Um, generally about exactly what it says open research about trying to drive an agenda of openness in a scientific community and that's both obviously directly with the people we fund but more broadly trying to um, align everyone um, to be on a on a journey which we've um, been on now for quite a long time we were i think pioneers in this area and welcome's been committed to this for a long time so um yeah, that's what I do. And specifically within the open research team, I work a lot on clinical data, um, both um, sharing it and uh, reusing it and the sort of transparency agenda around uh, making information as available as possible, both to patients and other researchers. Great. Thank you. OK, um, so first question then is how has open research been important um, so far during the current coronavirus epidemic? Um, well, uh, it's really interesting at Welcome because we've had this policy in place for a few years now. I think 2016, we had a policy that we added a criteria in our open access policy that if um, the topics that the researchers we fund are working on become public health emergencies, um, then they should be made available. And that's all outputs of the research we fund. So that's um, publications, uh, results, um, data, um, code as Ros was talking about even putting things on github and so on open source and even biological samples and we wanted those to be made as open as possible as soon as possible um, and particularly with corona what we've seen which i think is really exciting is galvanizing many others to to come along with that sort of principle and so we released a statement in the end of January 31st of January and we asked others to sign up to the same principle which we already had established and so in um, fact we've over a hundred signatories now so you can see on our on the welcome website um, all the other funders and organizations who've signed up mm -hmm. and I think it's been really brilliant to see how much people have shared and then how much that's had direct really quick um, impact on on decisions that are being made within policy too so that's um it's it's been i think it's been a really great example of um of how open research can can take effect i mean the slight frustration is obviously always thinking well if it can happen like that for mm. this why can't it happen more generally in a normal situation but having uh having seen some of the people working on coronavirus and how exhausted and committed <laughs> looking. I wonder if, you know, it's quite a high expectation to think that you could set up a clinical trial in eight weeks uh, for all clinical trials or, you know, that, that kind of concept. It does mean people are working extra hard right now and, and maybe that's not sustainable um, permanently, but, but it's a great example of the possibilities of how yeah. fast things can move, yeah. Absolutely. So can you say um, a little bit on what the barriers are to open research, maybe with clinical data, data in particular? and how they, um, you know, ex examples where you've seen those overcome. Yeah, um, sure. So, I mean, we've done quite a lot of work at Wellcome in surveying and, and commissioning work that's, that's asked those kind of questions. So I think we have a pretty good idea. Very recently, um, we again surveyed lots of people working on clinical trials specifically um, about the barriers and why we're perhaps not seeing as much um, open science behavior as we might have expected a few years ago. There's always this balance of policy driven versus sort of bottom up, if you like, of the community adopting things. And uh, it's quite clear that just um, mandating does not always just have the, the best effect in terms of behavior change. So there is a balance of like how much we can directly try and drive people and how much uh, there are more subtle approaches to, to increasing uptake. I think um, one, some of the barriers uh, were funding. They were definitely cited early on um, that funders needed to pay for this, and we heard that. And so very early on, that was always written in that people could cost uh, the costs of, of sharing within their applications to welcome. And that's true of many of the other funders that we connect with now too. 
Um, having said that, there are issues around people maybe not even knowing what the costs are that they need to include. So, you know, there's a bit of kind of guidance and support um, that we need to also back up with. Um, I think also it, uh, a few years ago, the barriers were literally technical. There were issues about where to share your data, what kind of access route, because obviously with clinical data, there are concerns around re-identification of patients and that being sensitive data. And we've come a long way on that. I think um, there are now hundreds of repositories available. Um, there are um, lots of tools available for anonymization of data. Um, there are examples, really exciting examples of keeping the data within secure environments and just bringing the analysis to the data as opposed to traditionally thinking about, you know, sending your data files out to different people. So I think models have evolved. And what's exciting is that the community has organically developed some of these models themselves. Um, and I think that's really pleasing to see that, um, that, that once people feel that there's a positive reason for them to do it, they, they, they work out a way of enabling it to happen. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so I wonder if you can give some advice uh, or sort of tips to some of our researchers in terms of what they can do um, to make their research more open. Mm, great. Um, well, um, as cited by Roz already, I think um, the exciting field of preprints and um, thinking about whether you can put some stuff up there. Um, so she, she mentioned as well, Med Archive and, um, and those kind of places. There's also uh, sort of preprint journals, which are where you like F1000, where you put your, your paper up and then you have an open review process. Um, and those are quite exciting. And we're certainly encouraging people uh, to use those, especially maybe early, early career stage where I think the real benefit of, uh, of the open peer review is that you can get comments on your work from anyone around the world who might be an expert in that field and you can change your versions of your paper so you can keep updating it's like live versions of your paper and results and improving it um, and we have uh, our own publishing platform called welcome open research which people can use and we're seeing really good uptake of that now so if you're welcome funded you can publish there um, so lots around the publications uh, where to publish and the idea of opening open review and then I guess the other thing is just thinking genuinely more broadly about the whole remit of outputs from the research that you're doing so don't focus purely on a publication that's what we would be really encouraging people and we are actively trying to articulate that clearly in our applications our funding applications and the way we assess them and reward um, and support researchers we fund. So we now have an outputs management plan and we would expect researchers to think about the range of outputs from their research, um, not just publications, but code and data um, and even biological samples if that's relevant. Um, and those are all things that you can cite as outputs from your research. And I'm hoping also with um, signing up to things like DORA, which is the San Francisco Declaration on uh, research assessment uh, means that we are also pushing institutions to kind of think about the principles on which they reward researchers and so again if you're a researcher based at an institution which has any kind of welcome funding please raise the profile of that from 2021 we're going to be requiring institutions that we fund to sign up to those kind of principles about how they uh, reward their own staff and I think it would be great if researchers owned that you know and lobbied for it within their institutions and make sure you ask the questions of how am i being assessed for tenure how do you you know what criteria have you now got what's your documentations for how you're adopting these principles um yeah so multiple things you can do um and of course we have funding specific for open research projects so if people want to do something that's kind of driving the agenda uh, welcome certainly also financially supports um innovative ideas so come to us with those Great, thank you. That's really helpful, helpful advice and tips. Um, mm -hmm. so a final question for me then, just thinking about um, 2021, you mentioned and onwards, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could say a little on the future of open access, maybe touching on Plan S. Yeah, so um, that has, uh, is continuing to take up a lot of the team's time. Um, Welcome is certainly um, completely committed to this. So for those that don't know, um, it's, a, it's, it's a coalition of signatories, um, Coalition S, and it's all about 
to the, the, the basic principle is, to, is driving open access. So you don't pay to read anything in the publication world. And that's obviously a bit of a shift to the current models. Um, it's more of a shift for some than others. Um, and some are, uh, it's fair to say, more reluctant uh, about making that, that change um, than others. Um, but we're committed to it. And it means that certainly for welcome funded um, grantees from 2021 they will have to publish open access only and there are various ways to do that but it's essentially about getting the right license up front and making sure that your um, author accepted the the author accepted manuscript is available for anyone to read without paying um, and i think the whole community is moving this way. Uh, welcome a, a right at the centre of it, but there's plenty of others that are all signed up for this too. And we are going to see a shift in the publishing industry. And I think um, it's not, it's, it's just a matter of time of when everybody's going to get there, but I think everyone is going to get there in time. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. That was really interesting. So I'll okay, um, now no open, open questions um, to the floor. Uh, well, mm. while you're, busy pondering up questions. I wonder if Rod, if you might have one or two. I'll just always put a question or two. I am. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so I just, um, you know, it's great to see and, and I think, you know, something in HGA UK, you know, the Melissa's leadership, we're keen to, you know, support our community to embrace these models as much as possible. Um, one of the pieces of feedback I've had in the past is it's all well and good us talking about, you know, early query researchers, you know, massive swell of that bottom up use of preprints and open mm. GitHub approaches, etc. But actually, when it comes to it, when it comes to that job interview or that fellowship mm. interview or that panel that you're, you know, put 10 years of your life towards mm -hmm. and they ask you, where's your big publication? How, how would you advise people to kind of, you know, manage this transition in that, you know, those tricky situations when they're putting their career on the line versus the, the greater good, if you want to call it that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it, we are trying our best to to drive uh, in in all um, at, in all different directions with all different stakeholders. This is no like single um, a single intervention solution. So not not a single thing is going to solve this for everyone, right? We know we have to tackle this at all different levels. Um, I think I'm hoping that people will will have faith and that this is gonna we're gonna make it there um but i think that we have articulated examples of requirements and so this has to be backed up with policy and evidence and and from welker's point of view we absolutely have that there we have sanctions that are going to be in place for people who don't adhere to our policies and that's the same for individuals as it is for the institutions so the requirements are coming in and as more and more funders join that it will be a case of who are the few that are left out of this rather than who is leading it at the beginning. I was really encouraged just to kind of give you a specific example. Um, only yesterday we had an event at, at Cambridge University and somebody in the audience, about, about Plan S and, and, the, and the new welcome policy for open access, and somebody in the audience, one of the researchers said, this will um, ultimately put me at a disadvantage than, a, than another non-welcome funded grantee because I won't be able to get that nature paper and they will. And the head of the unit who was there, so this was not a welcome response, uh, stood up and said, I'm not even going to allow that question to be answered because it's against the Dora principles and we you know we we adopt those so I just think that's a fantastic example of where actually this is this we're already getting there we're, we're getting to a point where this is becoming embedded if you have visionary committed leaders within these academic institutions you know it's not welcome that's that's destroying anything or, or making it difficult it's about a behavioral change and a culture change and I think um, we're hoping that we can encourage people and support them to get there. Um, but I think actually that demonstrates that some places are already um, already there, you know, and, um, and, and, and that isn't gonna, you just, just forget about impact factor or journal name. That's essentially gonna be blinded, I hope, you know, we imagine the day when, when that will happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just, just to, I guess, a, more of an offer than a question, I could see, um, uh, is, is maybe where you see that best practice and actually where our community, anybody online right now, you know, has examples of good practice. I think Heisha UK could really help to, to root that out to actually yeah. shine a light on where things are, are working. So maybe that's something we can, we can pick Great. up. Great. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Anybody that's Thank online you. right now, you know, feed yeah. in those examples yeah. so we can show, yeah. show the way. 
Yeah, absolutely. So related to that, then a question from mm -hmm. uh, Zoomland is, do you have uh, standard best practices for publishing open health data, like metadata, CSV standards? Oh, this is, yeah, such a good question. Um, it's still, um, I would say, it, well, for starters, I would say, I don't think it's up to welcome, and certainly not welcome alone, to be setting these things. It has to be a community agreement. So I would want to work, work with people to, to understand which is the best um, way to go and what do the community feel that, uh, that the right standards are for them to agree on. And it may be, um, there are some things that are that cross disciplines, there are some things that are very domain and, and disease specific um, in terms of standards, but it's absolutely a key area that needs more work. And uh, we currently do not require uh, specific standards. We're not um, mandating at that level of detail. Um, but it is a question that I've been asked um, multiple times and, and it may be that we need to get to some point of agreed standards, certainly for like repositories and metadata. And we know that's a big gap at the moment, like the institutional repositories have very little standards employed and that makes it extremely difficult to, you know, search and find things. So a recognised gap, um, a good question and, and no uh, straight answer at the moment, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. And a final question then um, relating to reproducibility. So is this linked um, to efforts around reproducibility, such as the UK Reproducibility Network? Yes, um, completely driven um, with that in mind. Um, we believe that if the outputs of the research that we fund are made more available, that inevitably leads to um, a decrease in waste and uh, improved reproducibility. I know myself, that archiving properly a data set you worked on means that two years later when you come back to it, you can actually understand it again. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just increasing that kind of um, good housekeeping. It's, it's like good basic data management housekeeping. Um, and that's gonna be good for everyone and certainly, and also on the reproducibility um, question, I think the issue is also the unpublished uh, data that's out there and results. And it's getting at that too, making sure that everything's accessible means that we're not losing half the picture that, that we are at the moment so um yeah certainly reducing waste and uh, improving reproducibility absolutely great georgie thank you so much for your time this has been really no interesting worries. really stimulating and given us a lot to think about actually going forwards um thank so you. thank you very much okay cheers thanks take care uh right so then on to our final uh, slot. So Roz is going to talk to us about some of uh, the latest news from HDI UK Central. Great. Thanks, Melissa. And thanks to our um, fantastic speakers. It's been um, great to listen in and, and learn lots along the way. Um, so in our last um, 10 minutes, rapid fire as ever, um, just a few highlights that you hopefully see um, from our Hive newsletter, which everybody should receive. Um, you can, uh, if you haven't already seen it, then um, do register via our website. Um, so a few deadlines to start with. Um, so we're building up our better care portfolio um, and looking for great opportunities to work in partnership to really put the value of data um, into practice at the, at the level of patients. Um, and the NHS. Um, so this is a program that's been developed and um, working very closely with the Health Foundation and we're also in, in close contact with colleagues in the Accelerated Access Collaborative to make sure that our collective efforts um, add up. Um, and the key net date is, is 11th of March, which is next week. And Melissa's <laughs> okay. looking at Melissa, um, who's waiting in anticipation for your applications. Um, and also a new colleague, just to mention, that's joined the central team, Alice Turnbull, um, who will be taking forward the Better Care Programme um, from, from now onwards, um, supporting Simon Ball and Alistair Denison and team. Um, so just as a subset of that, um, to mention that we are going to close um, the query process. So we've been taking an iterative approach to the queries um, and making sure that any query answer is published um, so everybody else learns from that. Um, so if you have any last minute queries, please do make sure you send those in by tomorrow. Um, so great news as well. Just again, I um, hope you've seen via our communications that we've got some exciting new partnerships to announce. Um, so incredibly pleased to say that um, Mike Inouye and colleagues, um, particularly Brent Richards um, over in McGill University, Canada, um, were successful in receiving one of the 10 um, UKRI um, awards to look at responsible use of artificial intelligence. Um, so they are, they're building a great international team um, connected across the UK with many others, including um, the, the UK Biobank team and the uh, East London Genes of Health team um, to, to really think about how we 
make uh, polygenic risk scores more equitable um, when quite a lot of the genetic data that are used for these risk scores at the moment um, come from um, white ethnic origins. Um, so that's a great international collaboration to kick off 2020. Um, and, and on that theme of kind of making good use of, of genomic and multi-omic data in particular, um, another great partnership um, that's taking place um, following some EPSRC investment um, between Adam Butterworth and team um, in Cambridge um, um, with the tier two um, HPC facility um, based in Cambridge as well. So it's sort of great to see that bridge happening across um, the health and engineering disciplines. Um, lots of stuff happening in the patient engagement space. Um, some, some fantastic reports. Um, one um, that uh, we shall, um, the HJK team can take credit for, working in very close um, collaboration with the Academy, Academy of Medical Sciences um, and then the CASME unit um, when I was at UCL um, and uh, published um, this following a workshop in January um, just last week. Um, so you can read that on the website. Um, and also our deputy director, Caroline Cake, um, spent the weekend um, engaging with the public and citizens as part of the Citizen Summit, um, led by the One London um, Consortium with, with lots of faces that are familiar there as well, including Tim Hubbard. Um, so thanks, Tim, for your contribution as well, because um, uh, it was great to have presence at that. So hopefully some, some really great understanding of how we do our work in a way that's trustworthy um, and really represents um, the expectations of the public. Um, great to see these sorts of outputs coming um, from this work. And, and just to flag um, something that we've been um, kind of contributing to indirectly um, is the great work from Understanding Patient Data and the Leda Lovelace Institute was also published yesterday looking at the foundations of fairness and in particular um, relationships between um, NHS health data and, and commercial uses. So a great body of evidence now for us to get our our teeth into and make sure that as we deliver what our mission that we're doing that in a fair and equitable way for to deliver patient benefit. Um, following on from that, lots um, of great blogs happening. So most of these you will hopefully see in, in our Twitter feed every Tuesday, roughly, um, we publish a blog. Um, but to say we've been working with Reform in particular, um, and a, a great series of blogs came out last week, including from um, uh, James O'Shaughnessy, the ex-health uh, minister, um, Fiona Watt, the um, chief executive of the MRC, as well as many other notable names. Um, so do check that out. You can see that on the website as well. And, and it's a great series of blogs happening over January, really. I'd highly recommend checking into the website in the opinion page um, to, to look at some of the great outcomes and expectations that people have from the use of health data for um, public benefits. So rapidly moving on, um, one of the things we mentioned at the last webinar was that the Alliance Symposium was coming up. Um, so it happened, it was a great success, um, thanks to the team. Um, and that photo in the bottom right um, just shows you all, you know, everybody coming together to celebrate the progress that's happening, not only across the Alliance, but skimming very quickly through, but also the launch of the Gateway. Um, so if you haven't tried this yet, the minimal, minimal viable product um, is now live. You can search across 414 different data sets. Um, and, and just to show you the kind of the pace of change, that was obviously only step one, um, but we're already um, moving on in the far right of that diagram that shows you the progress throughout all of the Alliance Hub um, and gateway activities over the, the last couple of years, um, you know, leading up now to the rapid development tasks that um, different suppliers are working with, with us on um, to take the MVP of the gateway into its full launch later in the year. So exciting progress as ever. Um, and in the last couple of slides, um, many of you are, are probably a little um, impatient now to hear yet more discussions about exactly how the strategy is coming together. Um, but pleased to say, I think we have now settled on a final diagram, um, and this is it. Um, hold that thought slightly because our board needs to sign it off at the end of the month. Um, but we have definitely got there and it's been a great piece of work with everybody contributing to really make sure that um, all our efforts um, add up to something that is understandable. Um, and you'll be seeing these, these headings going forward. So our work to unite health data in capturing um, all the work of the Alliance and Gateway and, and many other things, including um, you know, work on trusted research environments and other activities um, will fall under the Uniting banner. 
our improving health data um, activities. So this includes um, lots of work that we are doing around data standards, curation, um, the, the, the great work that individual hubs are doing to make data accessible for research. Um, and last but not least, also incorporating um, some of the research challenges in here um, around use of analytics, synthetic data, um, and also the human phenome project activities um, and great opportunities already happening to connect that work more closely across um, what was kind of previously the Digital Innovation Hub program and then the original um, university setups really starting to integrate that into a bigger whole is very exciting to see. And then last but very not least is then demonstrating the power of this and actually using health data um, to deliver new discoveries and, and increase skills and to um, deliver benefits to patients and the public. Um, so, you know, really focusing our efforts around the Better Care Programme, understanding causes of disease, clinical trials and public health to show the power of the effort that goes into making data usable for research to really drive um, discoveries new science and new ways of um, treatments and prevention um, to really make a health and care impact. Um, so you'll start to see this change happening. These headings will start appearing in many, many different forms, um, including how we govern ourselves and how things uh, move forward. And that's really important right now because it's probably worth mentioning we're just kicking off our establishment review. So our nine core funders are going to be taking a very close look under the bonnet over the next few months to make sure that in our second two and a half years in, um, where we're really set up to be a successful um, long-term national institute. Um, so on that note, um, we are also building the team um, as ever, and in particular, great to see the BHF Data Science Centre coming into life under Cathy Sudlow's leadership. Um, and just to flag, um, short deadline, I think it's uh, tomorrow, the fifth, um, is, is um, an opportunity to join the BHF um, Centre team as the operations director. Um, more information as ever on the website alongside other um, adverts that are live at the moment. And last but not least is to say we're building up to our One Institute event. Um, so this will be taking place in Glasgow um, on the 16th of June 2020. Um, and, and, you know, lots of planning going into that right now. So expect some communication within the next um, two weeks um, and, and get yourselves ready for, um, you know, making sure that your accommodation and everything is booked. Um, you know, we will be communicating with um, teams across the UK to give you as much information as possible. Um, but you will have to then, um, ar you know, arrange all of that uh, independently. Um, and just to flag as well that we will be um, launching an opportunity to present posters at this event. because so we want to make sure that there's a, an opportunity for the wider community um, to, to show everybody what they've been doing um, and to celebrate the outputs of your great work, um, as well as um, some potential prizes um, and other activities that we are planning at the moment. Um, so we look forward to seeing you in June. And I think that's it. So as ever, thank you to Melissa and Fran and team for and all the speakers um, for today. Um, have we got literally 30 seconds for any last minute questions? Um, please do feel free to or, um, just email us if there's anything we've covered today that you haven't had a chance to ask about. So we'll just wait for a minute or two to see if there are any questions, but I think it's probably so, so beautifully explained that there may not be questions. <laughs> so uh, in that case then, just thank, uh, thank you to everybody for, um, for joining today. Uh, thank you very, very much to our speakers today, Ros Eggo, Georgia Humphreys, and our very own Ros Walker. Um, and we shall see you in uh, a couple of months, month, week, uh, month after next. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>